talk about like why organizations fail. I mean, the focus of this uh, panel specifically will be about one topic that is getting hot again. It was is a topic that started a long time ago in the uh, organizational discussions. That is organizational culture, and got like hot first in the 80s. Got like a little bit fading now in the 90s, and now it's, it's strong again when we talk about digital transformation. When we talk about people in organizations, as we have seen so far, in most of the discussions we had this morning. And this uh, culture is so abstract, abstract topic that sometimes it's difficult to put a hand on it. But the way we are going to talk about uh, culture, at least to start the conversation here, is how things get done here in the, the organizations. And when we see like the uh, rate of failures, maybe we should talk a, a little bit about why things don't get done here. You know, I mean, that is a big question uh, why culture could impact and is maybe uh, not speeding up organization, actually slowing down organ uh, organizational transformations. So I, I have here two uh, people that are executives that are managing transformations right now, and we will talk with them. But we also have uh, Anna and uh, Perry that have uh, connections with so many organizations, and they have a bigger view about what's going on today when you talk about organizational culture and transformation in organizations. So let's start here. I want to start with Eileen that is here. So Eileen, if you could uh, tell the, uh, the, the people here, the audience here, about like uh, your organization and the transformation that you're facing right now and what's the role of culture in what you're facing. Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm the Chief Talent Officer at Horizon Media, and we are the largest independent media agency. And I want to emphasize media as in advertising. I think it was Tiffany who said on a prior panel that everybody's calling themselves a technology company, but I also want to say that everybody's saying that they're a media company. And I think both are true. Um, and I think they're also saying that uh, we're all data companies, and that is also true. Um, I've been with the company for 15 years, and Horizon Media has th had their 30-year anniversary this year, and I've seen many different phases of transformation over the years at the company. We have a very strong culture. We're recognized um, as a best place to work several times over by several different um, organizations and associations. Uh, we are right now in a, another major transformation. We are a media company, but sometimes we think we're a technology company, but we're not quite there. But we're absolutely a data company, and the biggest transformation that's happening for us right now is the, in the data and analytics space. And it's showing up bo both with our clients, in terms of what our clients are asking for, and then we have all the issues of data privacy, because we have access to a lot more data than ever before. But also from a people perspective, and being able to attract talents with the skills that are needed to both do traditional media and the what I call like the emerging space is is quite challenging. So it's both an external and an internal challenge. And the internal challenge is we have a lot of people who are core media professionals, but they need to retool, they need to reinvent themselves in a way that's going to support the business as it's moving, moving forward in a new direction, which includes an emphasis on data and analytics, as well as content. And I think content is another big play right now for many of the companies, specifically um, within advertising as well. The lines of creative and content are being blurred, or quite blurred, between media and uh, full service. OK, amazing. So, uh, when you think about culture in an organization like media, and media, I mean, it's a sector that was pretty much the same for a long period, and they have now like all this uh, influence of data. And I mean, maybe you're hiring people that someone said here, or I mean, hiring people from Google and from other companies. I think you have the same kind of dynamic. Mm -hmm. How do you think that the way culture is being uh, changed is influencing like uh, the performance of the business and, uh, and the transformation you're trying to do? Well, culture is key. I mean, I like the definition that we're using, but I would like to expand it a little bit in terms of like, what is culture? I mean, culture is, it's kind of the DNA of the organization. It's the experience that people have. It's the defining experience that employees have and what they're looking for. And if you don't have a culture that's relevant based on your demographic, then you're already many steps behind. Our company is about 80% millennial. And so the need to be relevant to those employees, what it means in terms of the skills, the experiences, the opportunities. We all know it's all about being able to have a gig experience. 
we have a huge challenge with retention because of that exact issue. And so we're trying to create the gig experience internally and trying to allow for people to reskill, retool, and create new opportunities with an increase in internal mobility for the, to keep them because we, we need to improve on the on retention. So culture is uh, it plays a huge part in the whole equation. Okay, yeah. well, thank you so much. So, Scott, coming to you uh, as a practitioner as well in uh, managing transformation, if you could talk as well a little bit about your organization, the transformation you're passing through, and how culture plays a, a role. Sure, so uh, Hitachi uh, Ventara is, is actually an organization that was formed um, essentially as, a, as an output of the digital transformation that a company called Hitachi Data Systems was going through. So it was the assembly of three different organizations really to go after uh, both market opportunity uh, to transform the company, but also, uh, most importantly, to be receptive to the needs of, of our customers and the evolution and the, th the threats and opportunities that they were being presented with. So my role um, was acting as both uh, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Transformation Officer. And I think that became vitally important to take the strategy around digital transformation and be able to embed it into business operations on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that day-to-day -day basis is really one of those elements that make up, uh, make up culture really fundamentally in the end. You know, when I describe digital transformation, effectively, it's, it's essentially, and we've heard a lot of this already this morning, it's, it's people transformation. It's really nothing more. And I think you know, the technology is all important, uh, but fundamentally, you need to either train or bring in new capabilities to be able to run and work uh, the technology. But it, as in 90% of the cases, there are existing you know, business models that need to be maintained. And really what you're doing is you transform, is you're balancing the needs of that existing business as you fund the development and growth of a, of a new business and a new business model with new capabilities. And a key part of that is how you integrate all of those, those uh, strategic components and business components, uh, business model components around one unifying culture and one unifying cultural experience. So I think you know the, the key tenants for, for what we've learned going through the process is Digital transformation is, is at its very heart people transformation. It's about bringing in new capabilities and taking people with you in the journey. That in turn needs to be driven from that uh, external in environment. And I think some of the things, uh, you know, when I think about digital transformation, that 70% failure rate, I would, I would almost guarantee that that's because culture has not been a, a central component of consideration as companies go through the, that digital transformation process. And I'll, I'll maybe end with an, an expression I've used before, which is, you know, and, and this one's from, from Dan Pink, where he says that um, science has forgotten what business needs to learn. And I think, particularly in this environment where I think so much has been about te technological growth and, and data and about new application performance and so on, you know, some of the more fundamentals around human beings has been left behind. And I don't think that's been invested in. Uh, and frankly, that's one of the, again, the central pillars that organizations really need to put first and foremost in order to be successful with their transformation. So science has forgotten what, what business needs to learn. If you look at particularly in tech, you know, most of the functional expertise comes from either product or sales. People that come up through those functions tend to end up, and, and frankly, I, I, you don't need to be a genius to work out, they're probably the least disposed to be very strong on Absolutely. the, on the yeah. people component. So it's just something to consider. No, I love that. I mean, there is this book that everybody is uh, receiving uh, today, the Transformation Playbook, and there is one article here uh, that was part of, together with other 17, Chief of Strategy and Chief of, tra of Transformation. And we were trying to, uh, as a group, try to find out what were like the four big traps uh, for transformation. It's funny because we had a huge agreement that the main problem in transformation is our own people, including culture, you know? And it comes to what you're saying. I mean, and, and my question, I got, I, now I, I'm going to, uh, to you, Perry, that is, uh, so, I mean, we invest so much like to prepare the transformation, to plan, and I mean, you, you've been in touch with so many organizations in your practice, but, we are still neglecting, maybe, or we are still not paying attention in uh, the people side when you're planning and, 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 and looking at the transformation. What, what, what have you seen in organizations? 
Yeah, look, it's a great question. And, and I've got to say, I very much resonate with, with everything which has been, has been said. We are increasingly operating in a state of literally always on transformation within organizations. And that places a very high toll on people. And I think what's very, very important is to bring, if you like, science. And that starts with proper planning and preparation up front. If you're going to unleash the power of people, if you're going to take advantage or establish and take advantage of a high performance culture, you need to actually agree what those things are. You need to establish some ground rules. Uh, a high performance culture, for example, embedded in a clear strategic goal for the business, indexed to customers, indexed to purpose and what it means to employees, with a clear set of rules around what senior leaders are going to do, not in the easy times, but in the tough times to hold people to that, and what does it mean for the performance metrics. And that starts with senior leaders. Yes, it's about people and unleashing the power of people, and I think organizations are are very much starting to realize that in transformation. But you can't just unleash them. You've got to start with senior leaders. And the brutal reality is, if you look at the numbers of organizations that have gone through major transformation, after three years, typically only 40 to 60% of the senior leadership team are still there. So it starts with senior leaders. And what does it mean for them? Because it can be extremely disruptive. So you're better off to have those discussions, agree on what's been transformed, why, and what does it mean, and they need to opt in. And it's okay to opt out, but you need to have those discussions sooner rather than later. And then it's a cascade. How do you get the extended leadership team? Depending on the size of the organization, the top 70 to 150. And how do you equip them to be real agents of change? Champions, if you like, and as, as, discuss, as discussed earlier. What does it mean for them? How do they support a culture which energizes people practically? What are the things they are going to do? And at the same time, how do they drive accountability? Because you have to have metrics. Lead indicator metrics as much as possible to make course corrections. And then move from it just sounding good, as I've described it, to what are the practical tools and techniques that you're going to put in place, the minimal tools and techniques to train people up. And then know that there's no simple solution or framework. You have to make choices and that they are unique to each transformation. I think that's what we see. Okay, now you explore more of that. So I just want to get Anna. What I love about Anna is Anna uh, today is not only a professor, but she managed one of the uh, big schools in, at NYU, and, but she has a, a career as a, as a practitioner. She has a corporate career in HR and other areas for a long time. So she has like this balance of what's going on and what people are discussing in the academy, but bringing the reality to, 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 to the floor. And Anna, I mean, Anna is another one that have on one article at HBR, Prof, uh, Professor Tabrizi is the number one, but Anna was the number one article at HBR for a long time. And my question to you, Anna, is, uh, there's all those things about people, but one of the focus you're giving uh, to many AGR right now is that if you don't uh, update the praxis, nothing will happen. <coughs> there is a, a piece about people and how we empower people and you bring them to the conversation. But there is also like this conversation is how is the predominant praxis in management of people that needs to be updated uh, to, to make the transformation? You know, one of the downsides of the panels oftentimes is that uh, all panelists individually talk to the facilitator, but very rarely do we get the discussion. <laughs> and before I answer your question, I really want to sort of be on the other side of the argument that Perry just made. And I, I am actually, uh, I, I do not believe that the transformation will be achieved from the down, uh, from the uh, water, waterfall model of transformation. And um, having done a lot of work in agility and how agile, teams operate and how much agility and adaptability is um, a feature of successful organizations, we often see it doesn't come from the top. In fact, um, it, uh, a lot of times it's the, it's the leadership that gets it last. Um, and I think we're, we're experiencing this reversal of hierarchies 
and, um, and, and we need to, especially if we put customer first, because the customer is where the feedback is coming, and people who are the front line um, operators um, receiving that c customer feedback. So I, I do not think that in a successful transformation it's going to be happening waterfall down with the senior, uh, senior leadership that needs to be transformed and then tr the, the rest of their organization trained. Oftentimes it's the other way around uh, where we have a lot more agility, a lot more collaboration happening in the uh, in, the, in, the, in the trenches of their organization, and then uh, the transformation of senior leadership is more of a challenge. And, um, and so there's one more thing that I want to say, having reflected on this whole idea of failure and, and transformation. I also want to encourage us to kind of get out of the language that we are strapped into. We keep repeating the same vocabulary um, about transformation and uh, change, et cetera, its strategy. Um, I want to throw in a word learning to make it more democratic Love because it. transformation is about learning and to your point about what changes in, um, in how we um, approach people. We're, we have to understand a lot more about how people learn, period, and it's such a fundamental uh, human trait to be learning. Um, now we are looking all the way from child psychology to neuroscience. I think the most important element of so, you know, or aspect of science that we need to pay attention to is what do we actually know about learning? What do we know about unlearning? And mm. how do we accelerate learning? Mm. Um, so organizations that try to figure out how to help their people learn faster and unlearn faster are going to get there okay. first. Love it. And, um, and the other thing I want to say about failure, since this is the theme of our uh, panel <laughs> is that, um, yeah, we kind of were very disappointed, right? <laughs> we were like, what? We, everyone talks about success and we're going to talk about failure. But at the end of the day, I, I kind of decided that it's actually better because failure is now a feature, not a bug. Remember, mm. there was a kind of a <laughs> tagline, failure is not an option. You know, not failing is not an option these days. And so connecting a learning and creating the environment, and Tiffany said it so well, creating the environment where failure is just another feedback loop to us about how we can learn better and how can we learn from failure is, um, and how we can then, um, uh, how can we scale that learning fast so that we don't repeat the same failure over and over again. And it's totally democratic. It comes from all um, levels of the organization. Um, that's where I think the opportunity is for us to really understand how people adop adopt better uh, to the accelerated rate and how we um, you know, really become, um, become skilled at no, transforming yeah. ourselves. No, I love it. Just before I, I go to the next question, I just want to come back and be fair with you, Barry. So I wouldn't mind that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me be clear. I love Agile, all right? And I've been involved in a lot of highly successful Agile programs. I've also been involved in rescuing a lot of very bad Agile programs. Leadership matters profoundly. The model for leadership is changing. It's changing a lot. A servant leader, there's a lot of names for it. But you cannot, I believe, launch into a transformation without sufficient upfront planning and preparation. And I believe leaders have a great role in setting context. Now, a leader in a, in a transformation that emphasizes agility, that emphasizes short, fast iterations, has to play a different model. She or he has to let go of certain authorities that they once had. And that's not always easy. That's all the more why you need to confront some things up front. Because if you don't, you get part of the way into it, and then suddenly you can hit a wall. What's more, in a lot of organizations I'm in, you can't just let go of waterfall delivery. You need to have a mixture. and 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 and. and 
that is an evolving model in and of itself because many organizations are coming around to saying, we have delivery and it's actually a mixture of agile and waterfall and we're kind of bringing them together. Certainly many of the rituals of agile have great applicability in day-to-day -day management. So I'm not at all trying to, trying to say the world is about waterfall, but I am saying that leaders matter profoundly in transformation because without them, you can't unleash the talent and the capability of people who are actually essential for its success. Yeah, I love it. So let me go to, to another topic here because we come back to the culture and I think there is a, a lot of insights about how organizations can approach that uh, from a top down or from a more bottom up uh, uh, approach. But one thing that is be, uh, 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 along the conversation of culture today is, is this piece of diversity. It's funny because most of the approach that I see uh, when uh, consultancies come to support companies more like this traditional concept of cultural fit that at the end can become uh, a simple kind of recipe for disaster because it cuts at the end diversity in the organization. And even if you, if you bring diverse kind of backgrounds, you force people to adapt to one reality that is how this organization works and how you need to uh, 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 operate here. And I would like to explore your perception of this that is how do you make sure you have a culture uh, and how do you measure that and how do you control that? Because getting your point and uh, my perception is if people capacity to learn is a constraint, you know, the speed of transformation happen uh, being measured by this and how you do that in your organization. I want to start with you, Scott and Aline uh, following. Sure, and I think from, from my perspective, I think culture needs to be monitored as if it were biometrics, particularly as you go through um, a transformation. It's kind of like the pulse rate, the blood pressure of your, of your organization. I think, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting here, uh, Anne and, and Perry's point, I think uh, the reality of, of our experience has been it's been a hybridization of both, actually, because I think fundamentally the point on leaders, um, many, almost all, um, or certainly more than 50, 60 percent of leaders didn't make the transformation journey. So, you know, leaders who are equipped to be successful in transformation is something you need to get right very much at the beginning. And I think to Anna's point, it's really um, we engaged over a thousand people in our organization at the time, only 7,000 people directly on what we call work streams, 50 or, or, or so work streams. And that in itself is driving the new culture, the new behavior. So it is more agile, it's more decisive, it's more responsive. And it's really about then using uh, the combination of two of those things, the leadership to start to uh, make that much more ubiquitous across the other six or 7,000 people as it was for us. I think um, on, on the specific point though, I would say uh, that the diversity is vitally important. But I think what's also really important, as I've learned, is don't try to be something you're not. You know, I think organizations need to be true to themselves. It's part of what maintains the trust and builds that reputation for authenticity. But, you know, we weren't trying to compete with Google and Facebook, even though the skill sets w that we required were the same. It was, there was no point. It was just like we needed and we had a much more steady state evolving environment uh, and we wouldn't have been able to attract those those folks in the numbers or pay them the, the way that they would need to be paid anyway. So you need to be very clear about what you want your culture to change to or be modified to. And throwing new people into it puts that at risk unless you've thought through that first point. You know, one of the experiences we had is that as you bring in those new leaders, uh, whether individuals opt out or whether you opt them out, you know, that's a hugely important decision to get right from a cultural perspective. Mm. Because that, that kind of behavioral cascade still occurs. And if you don't get that right and you bring in 40, 50, 60 percent of your leaders are new, even if it's over an 18 month period, you will destroy what culture you had because you've got so many different influences and it decelerates all of your transformation experience. But there is not like a contradiction here because we want people behaving in, in, in specific ways. And at the end, I mean, when you have diversity, you can have the advantage of having people with different behaviors that could be complementary. You know, and, mm. and moving to you, Aline, and maybe you can come back uh, later, Scott, is, I mean, you're in an organization uh, that, uh, that is passing through a major transformation that is bringing people that have different mindsets and capabilities. And diversity 
few people talk about that, but the diversity brings bring clash and increase the number of clash because mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. different worldviews on the table. You know, could you talk a little bit how is that working in your organization? How you're trying to uh, make that work? So I, I want to say the word fit is my least favorite word, Whoa. and so many times hiring managers will come back and say the feedback they give after meeting candidates is it's not a right fit. We, that's unacceptable. We don't. We will not accept that type of feedback because one, it doesn't tell us anything and it's kind of riddled with some unconscious bias. So we've been working very hard to um, kind of figure this out. I will say my other least favorite word is initiative. All the organizations are going through, I will say, the, a commitment to DEI um, and it's an initiative. It's not an initiative, it's a way of being. Um, and we're trying very hard to increase uh, the diversity uh, within our organization, but also within our industry. But diversity is more than just what you see. It's much deeper than that. And so we have worked, um, we're in it. Like we're in the thick of it right now. I don't think we will ever be done. Uh, but we're trying to transform our hiring practices because that's where we have to start. We have to do both. We have to get in at the hiring level, but also what are we doing to retrain our leaders and the rest of the organization to be more open and to get out of what I call kind of this me too-ness, not me too, hashtag me too, mm -hmm. but me too in we like, people like to hire who they're comfortable with and it's sameness. And we have to figure out how to break that cycle. So one of the strategies or the tactics that we're looking to uh, use within our company is not to allow the hiring teams who have open positions to hire for themselves. Let's identify people in the organization who represent um, the brand, they represent everything that is important to our organization in terms of our values, our ethos, and our vision. And if you understand the roles and you understand what the business is and you understand what the clients are asking of us, then it doesn't, you, your hiring teams shouldn't have to, they don't have to hire for themselves. So if you can have objective parties hiring on behalf of the teams, I believe that we will have greater diversity within the organization. We're in that right now, we're trying that. Um, there's a lot of resistance to doing that, as you can imagine. Um, but I like to go with, I, I'm kind of like sitting between both Perry and Anna, like I get both of you. And I think it's both. I yeah. think you have to, leadership Beautiful. is absolutely yeah. key, but so much of it does come bottom up and we have a very yeah. strong grasp. Oh, I agree. Culture. No, it's it, both. It is, it is absolutely both. Um, and so we are going with the what I call the early adopters who understand it, who are more, maybe more a little bit more progressive in their mm -hmm. thinking and willing to try new approaches. That's amazing. So, and then another point about diversity that is, and I will bring to you, Anna, right now, uh, that is, uh, Caroline, that was in one of the panels before, uh, was telling, and I think that's quite insightful. Uh, that actually was a part of a webinar that uh, we recently did at, at Brightline. That is. What comes first, strategy and, and people? And I mean, even getting what uh, Rita said here, that they, oh, we need to be able to capture uh, the early signals, you know? And you think about diversity, you can only capture the, the early signals if you have cognitive diversity to be able to capture them, you know? And coming back to what Carolyn said is, should we, instead of thinking about uh, first the strategy, we should think about what kind of talent I have in my organization that could be able to respond to the strategy, to an unpredictable world, uh, instead of like ju ju just try to figure out what is the talent that comes later. And I mean, and coming back to your expertise in looking to HRs and organizations, how are you seeing that organizations are moving this uh, strategic use of, of people and diversity to make things uh, more uh, successful in the future and avoid fail failure? Again, back to the language, I think we're getting away from culture fit to culture add. You know, how do we create portfolios where we're adding value, adding perspective, adding a set of expertise, skills? Cognitive diversity is coming in big right now. So we, we are actually learning from failure um, to bring back to the failure of what we, what we failed on in our diversity initiatives, Eileen, in the earliest stages of diversity um, exploration. And so I think it's, it's about culture add, and absolutely 100% agree with you. It's about diversity for what? 
I think that very clear, and again, I don't like the word strategy, but what is the purpose? What, what purpose are we trying to achieve? And then based on that, try to see what kind of talent do, what kinds of talent do we need to bring to solve for that particular or achieve that particular purpose? So everything is connected in that world. So it's um, culture add and purposefulness of our diversity uh, orientation and clarity around um, how we get there through people. That's amazing. So coming back to you, Perry. Uh, we were talking a little bit last night about that, that and getting this point of purpose, and we have heard purpose all uh, the morning right here. And we were talking about like how some organizations are bringing spirituality, you know, not like in the religion uh, perspective necessarily, but uh, to keep like this purpose even stronger mm. uh, than that. And I mean, as you have like so many connections and connecting, I mean, how how are you seeing that unfolding in organization? Is that something that is, is already like in place. Yeah. I, I'm seeing more in, more instances of it. This this innate belief in the people within the organisation, and saying, how do we unleash that power? How do we use technology? How do we bring about really consistent role modelling from our leaders? How do we bring about ongoing capability development? And I think that's a really interesting one. Because if you think about where organizations are going, be it whether you're in a project function in a transformation or whether you're in running the business, more and more people are executing projects. And the question is, are you actively developing talent? Because if you're in a state of regularly dealing with transformation, are you equipping your people to deal with that? Right? In the face of a social contract that's being rewritten, are you doing your utmost to develop the talent of your people? Which means, are you introducing them to some of the best skills of Agile, for example? Some of the daily rituals around readouts? Are you doing your utmost to upskill people? Are you putting effective performance feedback systems in place? Really effective performance feedback. Do you have effective coaching systems in place? Do you have really top-notch online learning in place? So I think those elements start to bring purpose to life, right? Because a purpose which is centered around your people says, well, what are we really doing to try to consistently develop our people? That's I mean. And coming back to you, Scott, because that, uh, that's a conversation that came first between two of the two of you, you know, yeah. and how, uh, I mean, in your practice, in your life, has that like being full as well? You know, and, and how you bring that? So, from from a purpose perspective, I think you know, having been fortunate to to work for a company whose credo whose credo going back over a century is to benefit society through superior technology and products, it falls very naturally uh, in terms of what the company is trying to do with respect to purpose. It's it's it's, it's called now, powering good is the tagline or changing the way the world works. And I think it's not, um, it's not an advertisement, you know, it's not, we heard a lot about uh, razors earlier, you know, I'm not sure how razor blades could make the world a better place, but a lot of the uh, advertising around that would lead you to believe that to be the, the case. So I think, <laughs> I think coming back to authenticity uh, of the notion, what you are actually able to change and what you're trying to change and what you measure uh, as a company. And, and I think a company that, that I've been part of is, is very keen to measure its environmental sustainability goals, uh, puts uh, executives on uh, the improvement of the company, compensation is put against that. So there's much stronger authenticity and connection to that. And as a result, the entire workforce feels very connected to that powering good notion. And, and changing the way the world works. So I think I think the idea is really about, uh, we heard some other words today from, from a leadership standpoint, being an authentic leader, you know, and, and developing trust around that purpose and really being seen to role model it is critically important. But I, I totally agree um, with, and, and I think this point has been made multiple times, organizations really need to engage in the empowerment 
of that workforce, that development process, to make individuals better at enabling that purpose that the organization has set for themselves. So ending, uh, going to the end of the panel right now, and I'll keep you with you and we move to the others, is uh, look to this. I mean, my perception is uh, if you don't make people to transform and to learn and to uh, connect with a purpose, uh, nothing will happen. It's like the center of the piece is like the constraint of the process and the constraint of the transformation. So what would be a, a simple pra practical device? I, I know it's, a, it's complex when you talk about people, we are, talk about, we are talking about the un unexpected, you know? Yeah. Uh, but what would be the simple practical device you would give to this group here uh, that came here today uh, to better manage organizational culture, a so abstract topic in their transformations? I think um, one, one, certainly one piece of personal advice I could offer is don't under, if you're doing enterprise transformation um, in all its complexity and really shooting for something ambitious, it will be the hardest thing you ever do in your professional career. So don't underestimate the massive amount of personal energy that you need to bring to that over multi, multi years. And I think I would say, you know, in summary then, it, be sure what you know that you know what you're letting yourself in for, because people will continue to look to you for years in role modeling the leadership that's required to drive a successful transformation. That would be my advice. Ellie. Well, I, I was I'm going to go in a little different direction. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with the conversation because I feel like we're talking about people and they're like a commodity, and I feel like we're talking mm. about like an object, and I think that's part of what happens a lot in organizations and we don't engage with the employees within the organizations to be a part of whatever's going on within your companies. They have to be a part of it. They all have to have a seat at the table because of the diverse spirit of what goes on within organizations. The more we can engage our employees, the better. I love it. Okay, thank you. Barry, any recommendation to this team here? So I'm very tempted to talk about the importance of lead indicator metrics, but I won't. Um, <laughs> Because you're right. You're so very, very right. My piece of advice would be to not for a single moment underestimate the importance of communication. Authentic, effective communication and what it's going to take to achieve that. And really visit very, very strongly on it and have the metrics in place for that, but, but more so the reference groups and so forth. Uh, that's incredibly important. Anna, join this, the panel. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Eileen um, here about, um, we can't change or transform people. They have to transform themselves. We should create conditions for that. And uh, probably one of the most important things is to figure out what failure means to the organization. Because to me, it's the litmus test of um, a, a really sustainability of culture. If the culture knows what failure is, creates that it's a, it's a feedback, it's a learning. Make it frequent, make it uh, timely, and learn from it, and celebrate successes, but also embrace opportunities to try and experiment. If that doesn't happen, I don't think any transformation is going to be successful. Wonderful. No, I love your comment, Aline. And just to finish, and I think this panel, I, I think, uh, we are still struggling as, as a world, I say, to see how people could represent the potential to all the uh, possibilities that we have. People are possibility, we are just not considering that, complimenting you. I, I would ask you a round of applause to this amazing group here. Thank you so much for coming here.